What's going on, y'all? It's your radio love, Deja Vu, on the Deja Vu Show. But I have a special guest in the building. You all might know him from his shows on ESPN, on Sirius XM, all over radio, all over TV. Mr. Stephen A. Smith, how you doing today? Hey, hey, how you doing? I'm Thank good. you for having me. How's everything going? Everything is good. You know what, Stephen? You're really uh, demure and quiet in person. You're mm. this extra large personality on TV. I'm like, <laughs> this man always is running his mouth. Oh, but well, we're glad to have you, you in here. You got to conserve it. You bring it when it's time to bring it and dial it down when it's time to dial it down. I was really expecting you to come all in. Yeah, how you doing? Nah. No? No, no, no. no. That's not, I, I, talk, I talk differently amongst the fellas than I do in a room full of ladies. That's you can, all talk, you my can talk that game to us, too. Now, come I'm on. Not saying. that I know anything about sports, but go in the mall, <laughs> and I'm bringing it. There we go. There we go. All right, no. so what's going on? You, you're here today in celebration of HBCU Week, yeah. right? Tell me about your partnership with that and why you decided to get involved. Well, I mean, the mayor of Wilmington, Delaware, Amir Prosecki, along with the governor of Delaware, John Carney, and those guys had me down in Delaware where they were honoring me a few months ago, a guy by the name of uh, Earl Cooper and Ashley uh, Christopher, they uh, they they were you know co-creators of this HBCU week. It's the third annual HBCU week where you know you're just trying to bring attention to HBCUs and to let, and to let a lot of African Americans know that there's a lot of opportunities that are out there associated with HBCUs, and the more attention that you bring to it, the more they may be interested in actually attending HBCUs. Clearly, the attendance record in terms of participation with HBCUs is elevated, but not to the rate that the, you know traditional colleges out there have elevated. So HBCUs have a concern for that. Uh, they looked at me as one of the individuals that could help with that cause. Obviously, I'm a graduate of Winston-Salem State University, mm -hmm. which is an HBCU. Um, that With this particular event, they've got an HBCU fair that day, that throughout that day, where if you're a senior in high school and you show up with your grades and are, uh, you know the appropriate SAT or ACT scores, you could get a scholarship. You could definitely get enrollment into a college on the spot. That's amazing. And, and so I saw that they're going to have like 30 different different colleges represented that's right. there. That's right. Marching, uh, you know, Battle of the Bands as well from various HBCUs as yes. well. So it's all a good thing. I know that I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for an HBCU helping me and assisting me the way that it did. And I always promise Coach Clarence, Coach Clarence Big House Gaines, the legendary basketball coach that I played for, I always promised him that I would give back because that's the one thing that he asked of me. And so this is just my way of trying to do that. That's dope. All right, so parents who are listening, um, Delaware is what, three and a half hours away, something like that? Um, it depends on who's driving. For me, <laughs> for me, it's two. Look at you. Me, you better slow it down. <laughs> but yo, take the kids out there. I went to an HBCU for a second, Norfolk State University, mm -hmm. um, and it was a, it was so engrossing with our culture. And That's I don't right. think a lot of our young people see and recognize it. Back in the day, we had like, Cosby show before all the crazy and yep. then you know different, different world, world. Yep. and that made everybody want to go to an HBCU and of course the bands I'm from the south so you know we no want to march no question about it right but it's, a, it's a big deal and I think the biggest thing you know listen the education is important we all know that we get that right but you know li you know having to deal with corporate America and what have you, you usually find yourself when you're coming from the black community as being the odd person out trying to scratch and claw your way to the top but when you're at an institution of you know an HBCU variety you're one of many and all of y'all are going through the same battles and it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood you know and just a, a family kind of atmosphere that you come together the support base that you provide to one another uh tremendously assist you in and, and scratching and clawing your way to whatever your aspirations may be. And that's a really, really big thing. People can't underestimate how important that is and what kind of contribution that that can provide in assisting you in your climb to the top. Absolutely. Now, I just saw something where Jamel Hill was saying something and people just got all on her of saying something to the effect that if some of our athletes went to HBCUs, it would boost the the school programs and everything and it would go, give more attention to them. Do you do you concur with that? Do you well, agree? Well, first of all, her, her, article was absolutely right in terms of, you know, it was very idealistic in terms of what should happen. She's absolutely right. She's not wrong about that. If you had uh, a few marquee athletes in the right. world of basketball or football that banded together and decided that they were going to go to an HBCU, the world would have to pay attention to that. There is no doubt about that. But I think that from a realistic standpoint, I don't think that's something that's ever going to happen. She was feeling, speaking from a very idealistic perspective, which she does. I know her. She's absolutely 
absolutely great, and I get all of that. Mm -hmm. But from a realistic standpoint, with the money that's invested into these institutions, the level of television exposure that they get, the manner in which those things can materialize into something greater for them and their families down the line more immediately than ever before, you just don't see, I just can't see them ever trying to make that move where they go to an HBCU. You got, yeah, listen, you got Power Five conferences, for for example, signing contracts that exceed hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. And then when you see an HBCU, they're talking about, well, last year we made $18 million. I mean, it's just night and day. And in that regard, but it's those guys don't pay attention. Though, but it, it is unfortunate. It would take somebody to just... Make that change. No, seriously, for them to go and just one person to do it, don't you think? Well, if and one then person, but if one person does it, it's assuming that many will follow. Mm. When in reality, probably a few might, mm -hmm. but not many, because mm -hmm. the, you know the, the lives of the many outweigh the lives of the few, as they say. And when you look at the money that's out there and what where they funnel money into and the attention that they give, and you're able to garner from that for yourself, you're just going to look at that opportunities, particularly when you're an athlete coming from an impoverished background. It's going to be an uphill climb for you anyway. So you're you're literally pursuing sports in part because you love it, but be in part because of what will materialize from your participation in that sport. But to wait, then you make participated an in, in college sports. Yeah, at, but at I Winston wasn't. I was, if if I was good enough, I would have been at the University of North Carolina <laughs> instead of Winston Salem State. Now it just so happens that I went to Winston Salem State and I benefited tremendously from the experience there mm -hmm. as a professional journalist studying mass communication the support base that I had, the professors that I had. But when I grew up and I was playing ball, my aspiration was to follow a guy like Kenny Smith, who's now on TNT, mm -hmm. who's at the University of North Carolina, and Michael Jordan and guys like that. From an educational standpoint, my personal opinion is you can go to an HBCU and make it happen just like you could anywhere else. Absolutely. But in terms of the world of athletics, where you have the television exposure because of the television contracts and what have you, the HBCUs don't have that, which means it's a uphill climb. You have the mentality that you'll be playing in the dark, per se. People have that mentality, and they're just not going to pass up those big-time schools for the HBCUs. Like I said, Jamel Hill was absolutely right. She wasn't wrong with anything that she said, but it was a very idealistic perspective. And, and when you're talking about culture changing, it usually involves more idealism than realism. It doesn't mean that it can't happen. Right. It means that the likelihood of it happening is slim to none. All right. So talk to us about when the sports bug actually bit you as far as um, being a journalist, because um, <clears throat> it just seems like out of nowhere, you just start. I started hearing your name. I'm not a sports right. person, of course, right. but my husband will have it on. I'm like, oh, there. That, but that's yeah, how right. I knew you. Yeah. But you were everywhere. But before then, did it begin when you were at Winston well, Salem I, State? I was always in the sports. I always watched sports and what have you. And I was an aspiring basketball player. Um, I was good enough to get a college scholarship. But in college, I don't know what they putting in the food to these kids these days. When <laughs> I was in college, let me tell y'all, I was about five nine and a half, five ten, about 135 pounds. That's how. That's how small I was number skin and bones and you know but I could ball and so I went to Winston-Salem State but my first year there I cracked my kneecap in half oh I went up God. for a layup and my kneecap split in half and when it split in half and I had to quit school just to come back to New York to go through extensive rehabilitation because we didn't you know, again talk about the money that's available to you mm -hmm. the technology the equipment the money that mm -hmm. they had in these division one programs with the bigger schools they didn't have that at my HBCU so I had to use my mother's insurance go home go through physical therapy intensely for about nine ten months and then come back to school when I came back when I was gone my mother said well what you gonna do because you had an injury now what you gonna do right and I said well they say I could write you know I'll be a sports writer and I started writing for the school newspaper and that turned into me writing for the local daily newspaper ultimately I got a job at the New York Daily News to start my career after numerous internships as a high school writer say 14. that again about the internships because everybody I'm, thinks I'm, that it's gonna come back I'm in to very be a star. very big on internships we, listen a degree basically means is I can read I can write I can comprehend but it doesn't tell an employer what actually your skill set is and more importantly what your passion is when you have an internship it, it 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 indicates that you're committed to this craft that you're going for it mm. and as a result an employer is more receptive to bringing you on board and so i got an internship with the new york uh, the atlanta journal constitution winston-salem journal stuff like that 
ultimately the New York Daily News hired me as a freelance writer. That turned into a high school position a couple of months later. 14 months after that, the Philadelphia Inquirer came calling. I got promoted nine times inside of 10 years. And okay. as a result of that, it turned from that. And then I went into TV while I was writing for the newspaper. So, CNN, but wait, so I, okay, so when, yeah. when did the TV thing come calling? Because you're, you're writing, you're great, right? But how do they know that you had something that was going to pop on TV? The NBA had a lockout in the 1998-1999 season. Uh, the players were locked out by the owners. Um, and I was writing for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I just had sources that was feeding me all this information. And so when they were feeding me this information, everybody wanted to talk to me because they saw my articles in the paper. Mm -hmm. So the local guys in Comcast, one of the leading voices on Comcast at the time in Philadelphia, is a guy that now works in New York for NBC. His name was Bruce Beck. Mm -hmm. He still works here at NBC now. And he would bring me on to talk about the lockout. Mm. I knew that they wouldn't pay at Comcast. I did not care. I asked for one thing and one thing only. I said, can I get at the time a VHS or a DVD copy of my of my appearances? Right. I kept that and used that to build my portfolio. And then when CNNSI saw that, they asked me to come in for an audition. I knocked it out the park. They hired me on the spot. I worked there for two years. Fox Sports came calling, worked there for two years. ESPN came calling. Steven, bring me up to speed with what's going on sports-wise. I, I don't know, so I always preface this. Y'all know I don't know my sports. I know Cowboys, because Hubby Lish loves Cowboys. Oh, Lord. Well, excuse me? I'm, I'm, they I'm just not, won last I, week. I know that much. Well, they beat the hapless New York Giants, <laughs> um, who have one players. who have one player in Saquon Barkley and pretty much nothing else. Uh, we'll find out what the Dallas Cowboys are made of. They're a good team, but uh -huh. are they winning the Super Bowl? Hell no. How do you know that? Because I don't believe it. They you got a what? black cat running around their franchise. Something will happen. Just just let, let it let Stop it Stop being evil. No, I'm not evil. I'm a <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I'm not a Dallas Cowboy fan. And mm -hmm. Dallas Cowboy fans are the worst people on the planet. They are not. They turn up. I, I went to one of the... the... Mm -hmm. What is it? The tailgating things yeah. at the stadium? It was crazy. I've never seen the, anything the, the, like the, the it. The Dallas Cowboy fans are the most delusional people <laughs> you'll ever meet in your life. They can go one and fifteen. They can go three and thirteen. This season, they are America's the, team. The, the, this season can end on January third at seven o'clock, and by seven fifteen, they're like, you know, we're gonna win the Super Bowl next year. Right? <laughs> this is what they do every single year, and it's twenty four years and counting that they have not won. You know what? Don't rush that to me. Do not do it, Steven. I'm just giving you facts. Do not, not do it. 1995. <laughs> 1995. All right, so what's up with A.B., this this guy that we're hearing so much about? Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown. Why are we hearing about him? What's And now crazy stuff is going on. They well, just gave him a, a, a $15 million contract, well, you, and now we're hearing lawsuits? You were hearing about him over the pre previous few months, number one, because he wanted to force his way out of Pittsburgh because the guaranteed money had expired, and he wanted out because he wanted to get paid. Did you think so he should have stayed there because you that's your team? Yeah, was he good? I, he's sensational. He's a sensational player, one of the top two receivers in football. Uh, but he can be a headache, but he was worth it. Uh, but what the problem was they weren't going to pay him. He wanted to force his way out. Plus, he wasn't getting along with Big Ben Roethlisberger, the quarterback, so he wanted out. They ultimately traded him to the Oakland Raiders for a third round and a fifth round pick. They gave him a guaranteed $30 million deal. Mm. Despite the $30 million in guarantees, uh, he engaged in what I consider to be clownish and very buffoonish behavior. Um, he was acting up on social media. He was calling out dudes, black dudes, Uncle Tom's, throwing his whole former coach under the bus, throwing his former teammate Ryan Clark under the bus, talking bad about Big Ben Roethlisberger and what have you. Then he goes to France, goes through some cryotherapy treatment, jacks up his feet to the point where the bottom of his feet had a thick layer of yellow coating the entire, his entire foot, which was disgusting. So he had that, and he couldn't practice. Mm. Then they overcame that, and then there was a helmet issue. He wanted to wear his own helmet, the helmet that he had been wearing for the previous 10 years. What happens? He files a grievance against the National Football League. He loses that. Files a second grievance against the National Football League. Keep in mind. So all I, this is over a helmet? Yes. Now, keep in mind. There are, at the time, 89 players on a roster. Uh, there are over 2,000 players in the NFL at this particular moment in time. He is the only one that was complaining about the helmet. The only one, okay? <laughs> so he threatened to retire and all of this other stuff, and the Raiders were getting tired of it, and ultimately he squashed that. But the Raiders had fined him because rather than just complain about the helmet, he would skip practices, not show up, and this stuff like, like that. This sounds like a two-year-old throwing a yes, tantrum. Absolutely. So the Raiders find him. Once they find him, 
He stepped to the GM, got in his face, threatened to punch him in the face and all of this other stuff, mm. was relieved from practice, was supposed to meet with the coach a particular night, stood the coach up, didn't show up. And then after apologizing to the team at approximately 12 noon, West Coast time, about 45 minutes later, he goes on social media yeah. and, and not only calls out the team, but literally divulges a private conversation with him, the coach, and some videographer over YouTube. And, and upon upon that happening, they immediately let him go. Mm -hmm. All right, the rate the 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 Patriots picked him up inside of three hours, gave him a one year deal, nine million guaranteed, million dollar sign up bonus, five million in incentives. He posts on media businesses booming and stuff like that. You know, with He's some running with all some around stuff, and all running that. Running all yes. around and all of this other stuff. And then less than 48 hours later, we learn that a, 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 tr a former trainer of his by the name of Brittany Taylor is accusing him of pushing her head down on the bed and forcibly raping her. Mm. And she's filing a civil suit against him. Not a criminal. It's not a criminal case. But the NFL is investigating. They're scheduled to speak to her next week. And as a result, there's a debate as to whether or not he's going to play or ultimately be put on the commissioner's exempt list. And for those who don't know, the commissioner's exempt list is a list that the commissioner has. Basically what happens is, is that the commissioner is allowed to pull you off the field and disallow you from playing mm -hmm. because you're bad for the league. It doesn't take away your money. You still get paid your salary but it, take, it it prohibits you from playing. And right now, he's in jeopardy of that happening to him. A lot is contingent on what happens with the meeting between the league office, the commissioner, and Brittany Taylor, the person who's accusing him of raping her, who, by the way, is getting married this weekend. Oh, my God. This is crazy. Yeah, that would be Antonio Brown. But, <laughs> but they're still giving him money. Well, they have to. He signed a contract. They were unaware of these allegations against them at that particular moment in time, purportedly, and the contract is purportedly. guaranteed. Purportedly. Well, well, put it. Let's put it all in perspective. You do understand that O.J. Simpson's still getting paid, right? Paid from whom? A uh, pension, NFL. But Cap still can't get a job. There you go. But Cap did get forty million. Cap did walk away from the San Francisco 49ers. Cap did get beat out by Blaine Gabbert, not once, but twice. Gap, Gap, Colin Kaepernick did go 3-16 and 16 in his last 19 starts. Yeah, you're going to give me these, these stats again. I don't know what 10. that is, but he no, still can't get a job. I, man I, is... I didn't give you stats. I gave you a win-loss record. 3-16 okay, well, and 16 in the last 19, 1-10 in his last 10 starts. I will say this. As a black person, you cannot help but support Kaepernick for his for the stance that he took. Okay. But I would remind everybody that when he took San Francisco to the Super Bowl and when he took them to the playoffs thereafter, there was no kneeling. There was no protesting going on when he was winning. Um, the national anthem was the same national anthem that was being played then. But the stuff wasn't going on as prevalent as it was during the oh, time when some, he decided oh, to do that. Oh, some people would disagree with that. Some people would talk about police brutality or brutality on the part of police officers and some of the plights that black folks have been going through. We've been going through it for many, many years. Yes. That, uh, we were going through it when Colin Kaepernick was taking the team to the Super Bowl. He was not kneeling then. But because he decided to do one thing, then they just ban him but will allow somebody who's had this record well, of this crazy. I'll tell you something. I had a conversation with, with, with a dear friend of mine, Karen Hunter, yesterday. Talk to me. And I said this to her, you know, because she brought up the same point. And I said, you know something? The black plight in the United States of America, forgive me if I don't expect white billionaires to relate to that. They don't give a damn about that. They give a damn about their bottom line, making money and doing what they can to continue the money flow going. Keep in mind that at the time that Colin Kaepernick protested, each owner was handed a check for $226 million in terms of the profits that they had generating from the television deal and all of that stuff with the NFL. Mm -hmm. And they were still complaining about being worried about money. Mm. So just imagine, if you put in perspective, you're a billionaire. Right. You're pocketing $220 million in the palm of your hands via a check. And you still got a problem with the potential that this guy may cost you 10 millions of dollars. Does that sound like individuals or a collection of people that are concerned about our issues or are they concerned about theirs? Of course they're concerned I, about theirs. I, I don't expect I don't expect white billionaires to relate to the black plight in any way. I expect us 
to be able to showcase to them how it's in their best interest mm-hmm. to capitulate to some of our wishes and address some of our concerns so we don't make our problems their problems. But make no mistake about it, don't ever assume that they're going to care enough about our issues. We have to care about our issues. Don't expect anybody else to do it. We do care about our issues, but we're going to leave we it do. there. We're going to leave I it know there. We do. But I do want to circle back to HBCU yeah. Week. What will you be doing out there? Are you broadcasting live? You're going to bring out some of your famous first, celeb first, friends. First take, first take is going to be in the house. We expect to have folks from the Eagles there, folks from the 76ers there. Irvin Magic Johnson is showing nice. up in attendance. He's a vendor for a couple of HBCUs, um, and obviously he'll be there because he wanted to participate. I asked him to come, and he, you know, gleefully accepted my invitation. Gleef- Huh? Um, yeah, he's, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. You know, and um, so 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 that happened. And I'm hoping to have a couple of, of more people. I'm not going to mention who they are because they haven't committed yet. Uh, but I'm working on a couple of things. And again, the objective is very very simple. Uh, HBCU week is incredibly important. The objective is to bring attention to HBCUs. You can go and check it out at HBCUweek.org. Uh, check it out on social media at HBCU week. Um, and the goal is, you know, there's a lot of people coming and emanating from the African American community. We uh, we know the importance of education. Absolutely. We know what HBCUs can do uh, for us as individuals as well as for our communities. I'm a living testament to it because I'm doing quite well. And I graduated from Winston-Salem State University. I ain't graduated from some Ivy League school. All right. I go up against somebody and I, that comes from an Ivy League school every day and if you watch the show you see what happens to him. <laughs> so, see I what mean, I smell. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. All right. What it is. Thank you so much for stopping by. Tell us what time First Take comes on so we can watch you on there, too. First Take is on every weekday morning from 10 a.m. to noon. And Eastern he is Standard talking, time, talking, obviously. talking. And my Stephen A. Smith radio show is on from 1 to 3 p.m. every weekday on ESPN Radio and ESPN News and Sirius XM Channel 80 as well. And we'll both be at HBCU Week Friday, September 20th. So make sure everybody's there. Love it. Perfect. Thank you so much for stopping by. Y'all make thank some you. noise for Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> On the Deja Vu Show on WBLS.